tell that there are green sparkles on my face? Because I put in a lot of effort for there to be green sparkles on my face. Nope. Oh well. Once again, we are going to be talking about Marvel shoving a female character to the side to give Black Widow a subplot rather than an actual movie. Last time we were talking about Sharon Carter in The Winter Soldier, and this time we're talking about a character who didn't even make an appearance in Age of Ultron. For whatever reason, The Incredible Hulk did not get the response Marvel wanted, and the result was that they chucked out basically everything from the movie except William Hurt. Edward Norton, gone. Tim Roth, gone. Tim Blake Nelson, gone. Ty Burrell, gone. Two-second cameo from Amadeus Cho, gone. And Liv Tyler as Betty Ross, hella gone. Which I find especially disappointing because I think she's the best part of the movie. Betty is a bit of a departure from the standard Marvel leading lady, at least for phase one, in that she and Bruce had already been in a relationship before the movie started, and Liv Tyler gives a masterclass in non-verbal acting both through the movie's prologue and the build-up to Betty's eventual reunion with Bruce. She did have three movies as Adwan on Domiel to perfect it. It is 40 minutes into the movie before Betty says a word of dialogue in the narrative proper, but up until that point her presence is felt keenly. We see Bruce keeping her photograph, prompting a few more flashbacks to the accident that created the Hulk, and get the sense that this is all for her in some way. Now before we go any further, we should talk about the nature of sexy lamps a little bit, because uh, Kelly Sue DeConnick, who coined the test and, not too coincidentally, wrote the run of Captain Marvel that largely inspired the movie now in theaters, summarized the test as saying that women in narratives should be protagonists, not devices. Betty cannot be replaced by an object, which should be a good thing, but her function in the story as the emotional core slash love interest still feels a bit like a plot device because neither Zach Penn nor Louis Leterrier seem interested in letting her step out of that lane. Which is not to say that Betty does not do cool stuff, because she absolutely does. She has more than a few fearless moments, charging in front of military vehicles, elbowing soldiers in the face, and running towards the Hulk when most people would run away, but the issue is in how those moments are written and framed within the narrative. This is an instance where male gaze has less to do with camera framing a woman as object, and more to do with subtext and how the script presents the woman. Sure, Betty can do cool stuff, but her motivations all go back to Bruce. And logistically, that makes sense since it's Bruce's story that the movie is following, but that still means that we're not necessarily seeing the real Betty so much as we are seeing Bruce's perception of Betty. Okay, let's um, see what I wrote in here. Uh, Bruce Hart's Betty, gushing over Liv Tyler's acting, questioning whether or not this is fridging, if he leaves her to protect her. The point is that his perception might be accurate, but it's also at least a little incomplete. This is a film where you cannot define Betty without Bruce, which is a bit of a feminist no-no. And it is absolutely possible for a good movie to be bad at feminism in some way. I started this off by saying that I thought Betty was the best part of the movie, and I stand by that. I am most engaged by the scenes of her and Bruce, and, well, I enjoy them. So it should not come as a surprise that I am bored out of my mind in every scene where Blonsky and General Ross are expositing and building up abomination. I realize that it has to happen for the sake of the narrative, but that does not change my boredom. It's just me sitting and waiting for the next bit of adorability between Betty and Bruce. Theirs is a dorky, angsty, sweet and chaste Beauty and the Beast story for the ages. And this is, ironically, why I dislike Bruce and Natasha so much in Age of Ultron. I felt that Whedon was forcing himself to try and recapture that same Beauty and the Beast dynamic, albeit the one that he made work in Buffy the Vampire Slayer for Buffy and Angel. But you can't force that. Bruce and Betty's dynamic works because they already have a foundation. Their angst is driven by knowing what they've lost, and they still clearly care about each other as people before being romantic partners. It's evident in the little touches, the hugs they share, the gestures of concern and caretaking that they express, in their willingness to protect each other even if they can never be together. Which, um, makes me a little conflicted. Because it adds an additional layer to Betty. Ostensibly, she's accepted that she and Bruce are never going to happen, so her attempts to help him have no ulterior motive beyond just being a good person who wants to do the right thing. I will never forgive what you've done to him. 
It's where her relationship with her father comes into play that we get the best sense of Betty as a person unto herself. Tried as it may be, when confronted with two men who care about her on opposing sides, it's clear that she makes her choice based on her moral compass rather than what her lady parts tell her. Which is good because her dad is all kinds of unethical. I mean, how did he get from the end of this movie to being Secretary of State the next time we saw him? But did they not have background checks in the MCU? Does being a disgraced failure at capturing the Hulk qualify you to be a diplomat? If anyone sees Betty as an object in this movie, it is her father. His interests in her seem to be more a point of pride than anything else, a symbol of his failure. Capturing Bruce is just as much about proving to her that he was right as it is about redeeming himself to his commanding officers. So Betty calling him out on it is a highly cathartic moment. You made him a fugitive to cover your failures and to protect your career. Don't ever speak to me as your daughter again. Betty also has something in common with Nakia from Black Panther in that she predicts what the solution to the problem will be long before the end of the movie. She is the first to suggest that Bruce should attempt to control the Hulk rather than get rid of it, and sticks to those guns throughout the entire movie. She goes along with Bruce's plan to get rid of the Hulk because he's had more first-hand experience, but she is always willing to intervene and speak her mind when she thinks his safety is at risk. And that's part of why Liv Tyler was the perfect choice for this incarnation of Betty. She's so soft-spoken and sweet that when she gets mad, you know you've made a big fucking mistake. You know, I know a few techniques could help you manage that anger very effectively. You zip it. Marvel, there's still time for a red She-Hulk movie. Or a She-Hulk movie. Or TV series. Or, like, anything. Unfortunately, this has not and probably never will come to pass. The closest Betty ever gets to fighting is the attack on Culver's campus, which brings us nicely into her dynamic with Bruce's greener half. Betty pretty clearly never refers to the Hulk as such. She always calls him Bruce, and while that does fall into I know you're still in there territory, it works because, as mentioned before, she's right. The solution is not to get rid of the Hulk, but to accept it and learn to control it. That's why it took so long for us to get a female-led Marvel movie. It's because they were trying to figure out a way to stop the heroine from cutting through the BS so that the movie wouldn't be over in 20 minutes. <sighs> the last moments we see that have anything to do with Betty are her pining after a photo of Bruce and Bruce sending back the necklace that she sold while they were on the run so that they could get cash. Oh, so cute. The Russos confirms that she got snapped. Betty's unceremonious erasure from the MCU doesn't sit well with me because it reeks of a larger problem, namely how they were slowly cutting out female characters that didn't fit the mold of leather-wearing badass. And hold on to that thought, because we will be revisiting it next time. But until then, I recommend giving The Incredible Hulk a rewatch. Maybe you'll see what I saw in Betty, a character who proves that softness does not mean weakness, a character who had feminist potential but will never see it realized. We can hold out hope that Betty might return, but I'm not holding my breath. Marvel has made it pretty clear where their priorities lie. Merci beaucoup for watching. Please be sure to like, leave comments, share, and subscribe. I would love to make these videos more often, but to do that, I need your help fending off the YouTube algorithm. For early access and other benefits, please consider joining my Patreon. The link is in the description, and... I will see you soon with the end of our little exploration into Marvel Women. Abby and Joe.